Hallelujah. If you have your Bible tonight, if you'd like to turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter number 17 and verse number 6. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 17, verse 6, the divine text says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock at Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And Father, I pray now that you bless the reading of your word to the hearts of the people that may receive it as it is the word of God, not of man. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right, you can be seated. I want to call your attention to what it says in verse 6, verse six, chapter 17. Thou shalt smite the rock. And the smiting of the rock, and God in his faithfulness, brought forth the water that was necessary to keep this whole uh, multitude of people alive in the desert. And God, of course, is always faithful to do what he says he's going to do. He never has failed us, never will fail us. And I've, of course, been on that theme now for some time. And I want to re encourage you tonight to continue to trust the Lord in his faithfulness to do what he said he'd do. Amen. The Bible says here that this rock gave forth water. But I want to call your attention to what happened later. If you read your Bible, you know that again they approached the rock. And again, uh, Moses lifted up his rod, and instead of doing what God told him to do, he smote the rock the second time. God, in his gracious, gracious mercy, sent forth water out of the rock, but God told Moses to do something entirely different the second time. He didn't tell him to smite the rock. He told him to speak to the rock. And the reason for this is because the rock is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And being a type of Christ, it has great lessons to be learned from listening and reading and observing what goes on in the lives of these people. And when God said to speak to the rock, he was saying, Moses, the work's already been done. He's already been smitten one time. He'll not be smitten again. There is no such thing as a perpetual sacrifice of Christ. Christ does not need to be offered every time we meet together on a Sunday in some kind, in some kind of a transubstantiation offering of a Eucharist one time, once and for all and forever, and then sat down at the right hand of the Father. The work is finished. Therefore, speak to that rock. Now, speaking has a lot of power in it because by your words you're justified and by your words you're condemned. And from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Don't be afraid tonight if the Holy Ghost moves upon your soul to say something to the Lord. In effect, how God is able to supply every need you have now, all he had to do is say, I want water, rock, rock, bring forth water. Whatever words he might have used, and the water would have flowed abundantly. So our Lord Jesus Christ is far above and beyond everything that we could ask or think. The Bible says that he has made into us holiness, righteousness, everything that we possibly could possibly need. Our Lord Jesus Christ is that to us. To try to divorce a Christian from his walk with Christ is the most absurd thing that you could possibly ever do. Our life is completely hid with Christ in God. We are about the Lord Jesus Christ. If a Christian is not about the Lord Jesus Christ, but is about his church, or his ministry, or his pastor, or himself, he is no Christian in practice and practical theology. He might be saved, but he is certainly not practicing New Testament Christianity. We are Christians, named Christians, first in Antioch of Syria, because they were like Christ. And I wear it tonight as a badge of honor. Amen. The book of Exodus 33, verse 21, the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. If you want to see the glory of God, you'll see it in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Moses saw the glory of God, he came back. The Bible said he wist not that his face was shining. The people saw him. Moses didn't know his face was shining. 
But the Bible says he had to put a veil over it because that face could not shine forever. And I'm sure God did not want them to see Moses' face as it faded in front of them. And so the Bible says there in the Old Testament it was covered. But now with open face, the veil taken away, we look into the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see a glory that transcends time and space. A glory that is forever. And that glory is in the heart of the believer. And that glory will never fade. We see the eternal one, as I said to you this morning. Light from light. The invisible light becomes the visible light. And the Lord Jesus Christ is that visible light. He hides us in the cleft of the rock. We could get no closer to the glory of God than we can where we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not until we leave this world and go into the presence of God and walk on streets of pure, transparent gold. We are as close to God as we could possibly be, for we are hid in the cleft of the rock. He said, I'll pass by, and he did pass by, and God spoke as he passed by. And what he said bore the glory of God, forgiving iniquity for generations. Hallelujah to God. Exodus chapter number 32, I'm going to read about six scriptures here, all of them pertaining to the same great truth. Exodus, not Exodus, but Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. Deuteronomos, the second giving of the law. Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. 1 Samuel 2, 2. There is none holy as the Lord. For as there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. 2 Samuel 22, 2. And he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my rock, and him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. Deuteronomy 32, 13. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Deuteronomy 32, 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat, waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Then in Deuteronomy 32 verse 18, Of the rock that begat thee thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. The Bible literally teaches that I was graven, cut from a rock. Amen. And being cut from that rock that gives me substance, because the Lord Jesus Christ is our rock. How many of you know where the Straits of Gibraltar are? Has ever heard of Gibraltar? I know, I know folks my age certainly have, but I don't know what they're teaching in geography now. But Gibraltar is a magnificent rock that stands on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, on the very edge of the European continent, and there's a strait between it and the continent of Africa. And it's only nine miles from Europe to Africa. But what makes the Straits of Gibraltar so intriguing is that there is a huge rock standing there that can be seen from miles away. And it's called the Rock of Gibraltar. The Prudential Life Insurance Company, for I don't know how many generations, has had the Rock of Gibraltar as their logo. If you look at a map of Gibraltar, and you look at a, the local area around Gibraltar, there's really not much there, folks. It's a tourist a, a, a place to go to. It's got shops. It's got hotels. It's got restaurants. It's got a port and the, the British, uh, that is a British-owned uh, territory. And that's all fine and good. But here's the bottom line. If it were not for that rock at Gibraltar, I don't know of anybody who would want to go to Gibraltar because that's the only thing that sets it apart from anything else around there. But does it set it apart? For that is a rock that juts right up out of the ground that oversees the Mediterranean, and it is a magnificent thing to look at. You see, my friend, what I'm trying to say tonight, what gives value to Gibraltar and what gives value to the people around there is that huge rock that's sitting on the European continent. What gives you your value tonight that makes you who and what you are is a rock that is greater than Gibraltar, a rock that is higher than I. Take me to that rock, he said, that is higher than I. Amen. It is the rock that differentiates us. It is the rock that makes us unique. 
It is the rock that identifies us. It is the rock that is the source of our salvation. It is the rock that is the foundation of who we are. It is the rock that makes us what we are. We are about the Lord Jesus Christ. I went through the Straits of Gibraltar when I was in the military. Spent six months in the, six months in the Mediterranean Sea. One of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. The way you can just look from the ocean and look at the, and look at the walls of these, these hills and the homes that are built upon them. It's quite a marvelous sight. But when we went through the Straits of Gibraltar, we went through it night time. So I'd, all I saw was a few lights over there. I couldn't make out the rock of Gibraltar. And when we came back through, it was night time, lo and behold of all things. Amen. Twice I go through there, and I don't get to see that rock. And I certainly wanted to see it. And so, but I'm not willing to take another med cruise to see it. Amen. I hadn't been, well, been, I hadn't been married, but I don't know what it was, two or three months, and they jerked me up and going to stick me over there for six months in the Mediterranean. I tried everything under the sun to get out of God. I just know, I didn't know enough high people in high places. Being a, being a, I'll think of what I was at the time, a PFC, a Lance Corporal or something. I didn't have much pull. <laughs> so through the, through, through the Straits of Gibraltar, I went. Folks, have you ever seen a picture of the Rock of Gibraltar? You never forget it, do you? It's a beautiful thing. Have you ever seen a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ? Look into my face and you'll see the glory of God coming back out of who I am. I'm not Jesus Christ, but I am. I have the Holy Ghost in me that bears the image of the Son of God. And that image is for other men to see. In other words, when they see me... I hope they see something greater than a man. I hope they see someone inside me that's greater than earthly people. I hope they see someone inside me that is of the Lord. And that's the image that we bear. We have borne the image of the earthy. One day we'll bear the image of the heavenly. Amen, amen, amen. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 32, verse 30. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Deuteronomy 32, 37. And he shall say, Where are their gods? Their rock in whom they trusted. You've got a whole generation of people today who are trusting in the God of this world. Make no mistake about it, they are. And they arrogantly refuse the church of God and the gospel of Christ and our Lord Jesus Christ. They arrogantly mock you and make fun of you as if you are antiquated and that you live in a different time span and that you're not up with what's happening today. And boy, do they make fun of us. But well, that's okay. That's okay. It won't be long until you hear a shout. And when you hear that shout, you'll be leaving this world. And you'll be leaving this world behind and boy, when they're left in here with the Antichrist, believe me, they'll know what treachery is all about. Amen, amen, amen. What a sad, sad thing. The book of Job, chapter 19, verse 24, says this, that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. Boy, my, Job wanted something that would last. He wanted something of value. He wanted to put something down that would stand the test of time. I had the privilege of going into the great pyramid of Giza. Been there one time. I went down into that pyramid, deep inside that huge rock. I don't know what they do today. I don't know if they still can or not. But I was with Brother Bevington on a, on a Holy Land tour. I know this has been at least 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I went down into the pyramid of Giza, folks, the one that you see photographs of. I was in the heart of it. I went all the way to what's called the king's chamber. And the king's chamber is where they have this huge sarcophagus, this, this thing that's supposed to be a tomb of the king. And, uh, of course, no body there. They say it was never used for a tomb, that no body was ever buried in that. But I saw something in there that blew my mind. I looked on the wall of this thing that is thousands of years old, thousands of years old. And, and believe what I, and believe, imagine what I saw, graffiti. And the tour guide said, that's not contemporary. That's not current. That guide said, that's been there for thousands of years. 
when they cut the hole in this pyramid and put this chamber in here, the workers wrote this stuff on the walls of the great pyramid. And I thought to myself at the time, boy, when they wrote it, it stayed, didn't they? When you put something in stone, it's around forever. When you carve it into stone, it's going to be there. Believe me, it's going to be there. You can carve it into a tree and a tree will die and fall down. You can write it in the sand and the sand can be blown away. But you carve it into a piece of stone and it's going to be there. I have been engraven in stone. My name has been written in stone and nothing can erase that. Amen. Amen. As just a side note, you might be interested. I've got uh, somewhere, I've got a book on the archaeology, the archaeological discoveries of the Holy Land, especially around Jerusalem. And when I got this book, it was about 15, 20 years ago. And so there's been a whole lot more that's been discovered since then. But one of the areas in that book that deals with archaeology around Jerusalem and around the Temple Mount, it has a whole section dedicated to graffiti. The very, very thing I'm talking to you about right now, where... Uh, 2,000 years ago or 2,500 or 3,000 years ago, these people scratched their names or their messages or their pictures or something into the walls of stone, and it's still there. You can go down into, you could go in, you can go into the, uh, into the tell uh, at uh, Megiddo. It's 21 layers, 21 separate layers that built up this mountain that looks down upon the valley of Megiddo. There is a huge cistern that has been hewn into the ground, hand cut with stone, with, with tools where they cut the stone. You can go down these staircases, staircase, stone staircase, deeper and deeper into the ground and you'll see this huge cistern. Back in those days it was a big deal to be able to collect water and keep it. Uh, Masada has a huge cistern like this. As you climb up Masada, they'll take you to the side and here's a huge cistern. And there where they collect the water during the rainy season so that uh, there's many times during the year they don't have any water. But what amazed me was I could see the very pick marks where the pickaxe cut the stone. And you can reach up there and you can put your finger in the marks that were made thousands of years ago by workers who went in there and they hand cut these huge cisterns that hold water out of the stone. And when you do that, your mind can go back and you can think, I'm touching the very spot that he touched and some human being did this and they put their mark here and now here I am thousands of years later and I can see the very mark that they put in the stone. If you are marked in the stone, you're going to stay there forever. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah to God. You'll stay there forever. The book in Joshua chapter number 4 and verse 5, And Joshua said to them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. Take up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be, now watch this carefully, for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, as Joshua commanded, took up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord spake to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, carried them over with them to the place where they'd lodged, laid them down, and Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest which bare the ark of the covenant stood, and they are there until this day. And they are there until this day, April the 17th, 2000. And 16, they're still there. <laughs> they are still there. Now here's the point in this message. When they put their foot down upon the Jordan River, the Bible says that the pride of Jordan had swelled above its banks. This was the season of the year where the water was flowing. It was the, it was the largest that the Jordan would ever be. And it's called the pride of Jordan. They put their foot against it, stopped flowing. It stopped flowing and the, the, the waters built up a wall up to their north and they were able to walk across. And when they crossed over the Jordan River, 
they, were, uh, they, they, they did exactly what God told them to do by taking the stones out of the middle of the river and putting them on the other side and then carrying stones and putting them into the river. What it is, it's a transference of people. It's moving from one place to the other and taking the place of one in the place of another. And then the waters came back over the top of it and there it is to this very day. But that pile of stones, their own land has a message. God said, this shall forever be a memorial to you. Don't ever forget where you came from. You see, they had come from Egypt and they had fought their enemies, had camped at Gilgal, and now they were ready to come into the land. Gilgal means where the reproach is rolled away. Rolled away. I think there's a song, isn't there? Rolled away, rolled away. And the stones are piled up, and it's the stones of memorial. Now, surely tonight you remember where you came from. It's always good to remember where you came from. Don't ever let the devil drag you back into the past and make you think that you're still in the past. And don't ever make, let him drag you back into the past and make you think that you're still what you used to be in the past because you're not. But it's good to remember where you came from and how you got to where you are now. And I can say to you tonight, by the grace of God, it's been by the grace of God that every step I've ever taken, ever amounted to a hill of beans, if I ever minister anything in my lifetime, if any fruit ever comes of my labors or anything I do, I give God the glory because it's by the grace of God that he's used me in spite of myself. Amen. That is my attitude. He has used me in spite of myself. I remember, folks, I remember, I remember, and I'll never forget what I used to be and where I came from. And I think that's good for us. It's good for our Christian life. You don't, you're not preoccupied with it. Don't spend all your time thinking about it. If you do, Satan will beat you to death with it. And the things you've done, he'll highlight them in your life. Absolutely, you've got to move on. You've got to be a victor in Christ over what you were. You're not what you used to be. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. But the Apostle Peter said that you have forgotten that you were washed from your sins. Peter said, don't forget, don't forget where you came from. And so the memory's good. The memory's good. I've got a terrible memory. God knows I have. The Lord knows I don't mean to be that way. My wife, folks, she amazes me at the stuff she remembers. I marvel at it. I marvel at the, at the, at the, at the, at the kind of memory she's got. She'll come up with something and say, well, you remember so-and-so said so-and-so. This happened over here. This We had a wedding over there, and they did that. And then I thought, who are you talking about? I don't have any. I plumb forgot all about it. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> so I tell people, God has blessed me with a terrible memory. <laughs> Amen. I wouldn't want to be one of you. If you're one of those folks over there that you remember everything that's ever been said to you, <laughs> everything that's ever been done to you, Everything that's ever happened to you, you can go back 30 years and say, where were you on the night of December the 3rd, uh, 1967? And you can, I was right here doing this, and so-and-so said that. No, not me. Not me. It's a great blessing to just kind of live in, in, in limbo. <laughs> that's where I am. I know where I came from, but I don't remember all the details, but I know where I'm going. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Woo! I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Some folks have a time of it. They really do. And you know what? Most of my, my experience has been, if you spend all your life remembering every bad thing, every, every dog fight you've ever had, every falling out you've had with somebody, or everything your husband ever said to you, your wife ever said to you, you're one miserable person indeed. Amen? You've got to be. You've got to be. Get over it. <laughs> Move on. Life's, life is too precious than to spend all your time in the past uh, harboring hatred and, 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 and resentment toward people. You've got to go on. Remember one thing, folks. Uh, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We all mess up. So why hold that over somebody's head if they've messed up? Forgive them and go on. That's the best thing to do. Over here in 1 Samuel chapter number 7 and verse 12. I love this one because Samuel is one of my heroes, folks. You know that. I've told you time and time and time again. I have nothing but the greatest love and respect for Samuel the prophet. In 1 Samuel chapter number 7 and verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen, and he called the name of it Ebednezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And so this huge stone was there. Anyone could see it. 
And it was called Ebenezer. We say in English, Ebenezer. In Hebrew, Ebenezer. It's the stone of help. It's where God helped you. That would make the greatest blessing in your life tonight. It really would. It will change your attitude toward everything. If you could just go back and begin to remember the times God's pulled you out of a hole somewhere, or God's healed you, or God has, has restored a relationship that you've had with somebody, and, and you thought there would never be a, a, a kind moment again, or God has given a job to you, or God has done something for you, it's good to go to a place where you can say, the Lord helped me there. The Lord helped me. God helped me. And I can tell you right now, I can go back to the places. I can name places here and there where God has helped me and brought me through. When I thought it was all over, and it wasn't all over, it was just beginning. <laughs> when you think it's over, that's God opening another door for you. Amen. Amen, amen. So we read in the book of Psalm, chapter number 40 and verse 2, here are three in a row. And I just want to put these, categorize these as, just, as, as, these as general statements. Psalm chapter number 40 and verse 2. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Hallelujah. And I title this from the pit to the rock. <laughs> Big difference. And when they, you remember when they lowered Jeremiah into that pit? You remember when they did that? They lowered him down. You remember what the, 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 the lowering wasn't the bad part. That doesn't bother me. It was when he got to the bottom that he sunk in the mire. That's the part. That's, that gets the message over, see. Have you ever been there where you sink in the mire and you don't see any way out? And I've seen people commit suicide down through the years. And I've thought to myself, Lord, if only somebody could have gotten to them, if somebody could have said something, if somebody could have had a prayer with them, if somebody could have been there to restore them and, and, and give them some guidance. It, it's a sad thing, folks. And I've seen it happen. I've seen preachers do it. I've seen other people do it down through the years. They commit suicide. And uh, for a lot of people, it's the easy way out, they think. There's no hope. I have no hope. Yes, you do have hope. You do have hope. He is called our blessed hope. Our Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. It's not what uh, we think we can figure out. It's Him, the person of Christ. And so we find here plainly that He brought me up out of a horrible pit. You can get in a pit, folks, before you know it. You can, be getting, you can find yourself in a pit. Psalm 61, verse 2. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Amen. I'm glad my God's bigger than me. <laughs> Aren't you? <laughs> we make gods out of people. We really do. We make gods out of people, worship people. I think every generation I marvel. I asked the kids in here one time. It's been a while back. I said, how many of you young people know who George Harrison is? They looked around at these. They didn't have a clue what I'm talking about. Do you know tonight who George Harrison is? Now, you guys are my age. You ought to know. You ought to know. Ringo Starr, George Harrison. Does that start ringing a bell for you? The Beatles. Did you know when they came to America, they blasphemously said, we are more popular than Jesus Christ. They said that. They didn't have to say that. They could have talked a million years and never said that. John Lennon, is he the one that said it? And that guy blew him away up here in New York City. He said, we are more popular than Jesus Christ. And now we've got a whole generation that's never heard of George Harrison. Point made. <laughs> never even heard of him. Hey, don't be surprised that if the Lord doesn't come back in 20, 30 years, your heart throbs and your loves in this generation, they won't even know who they are. 20, 30 years down the road. Every generation has its own culture, music, identity. I've observed that down through the years. They want to be unique for them, for their generation. And so it goes from one to the next. And they think they're it. They think they've reached the zenith. They think their generation is it. But folks, I hate to be, I hate to be mean to teenagers tonight. I love you teenagers. I love the 17, 18, 19, 20-year-olds. I was that age at one time, believe it or not. 
And we thought the same thing. But then another generation followed ours, and then another generation followed that one, then another generation followed that one, and on down the line it goes. You see, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. It changes constantly. And it's going to change in your lifetime if the Lord doesn't come back and you live long enough. You're going to watch the things that you thought were so unique for your generation that you thought was so great. You're going to watch your grandkids turn their nose up at it. I'll never forget when I was uh, about 35, 40 years old. I forget. My, my, uh, my, 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 my daughter and, and her generation... I, I, I wanted them to hear the music that we played in our generation, you know. I wanted them to hear what we listened to. Back then, now I know you think I'm crazy, but back then in the 60s, you could understand what they were singing. <laughs> really? You really could. I could understand them. Man, I turned this stuff on today. <laughs> I don't have a clue what's going on. But I let, I let them listen to what we listened to back then, you know. Ho oh, hum, you know, big, that's your generation. They go out and they listen to their stuff. Now, why is that? Is the music today any better than the music was in the 60s? Pardon? Not a, not a little bit. I know we get a lot of argument out of that. A lot of, you know, I'm, I'm pitting one generation against another. I understand that. But what I'm trying to make a point tonight is simply this. Everything is in flux and it changes, but the only one that changes not is our Lord Jesus Christ. I change not. So John Lennon can say we are more popular than Jesus Christ. I wonder what he'd think now if all these millions of kids in America didn't even, which one was Harrison, the drummer? Ringo, the guitar, Ringo was the drummer. Ringo Starr was the drummer. John Lennon, uh, uh, what's his name, the other one? See, I grew up in that, and I can't remember. Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. I grew up in that generation when the Beatles came into America. I was a kid back then. And I remember how when they came into this country, here's what they said about the Beatles. I'll never forget, this was a big deal. And if you, if you folks are in here, in anywhere near my age, you'll remember this. When they came to America and they got off of that jet, their haircut was what everybody talked about. How many remember that? Their haircut. Their haircut. That was not the music to begin with. It was the haircut. And man, I tell you the truth, they look clean compared to some of the stuff you see today. <laughs> Boy, I'll make a lot of friends on that one. <laughs> Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine doeth him, I will like him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Amen. Now, when you build your house, it's not necessarily referring to the physical structure. That's fine in itself. But you build your home. You're building your home on the Lord Jesus Christ. It won't fail. Amen, amen, amen. Romans 9, 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling block and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. This is the stone that the builders rejected. This is a rock, and this is the rock of our salvation. And one day that stone is going to smite this image on its feet, and it's going to destroy the Gentile kingdoms. And they're standing tall today from 606 B.C., to the very moment, to this very moment. But when that stone that is cut out of a mountain without hands comes, that's the second advent of Christ with his kingdom, he's going to smite it on its feet, and down it's going to go. In plain words, folks, the destruction of the Gentile kingdoms is not going to be over a long, protracted period of time where they languish and die out. The destruction of the Gentile kingdoms is going to be instantaneous and apocalyptic and complete in one swipe when the Lord Jesus comes back. Wham! It's gone away. That's the way it's going to end. So until that time comes, it's going to get bigger, bigger, stronger, greater, and look like they're ruling everything until it all comes tumbling down. And we're about there right now. Amen, amen. 
I'll, this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 4. The Bible said that they all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. Now, that's remarkable. Turn to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21 and verse number 17. There's a great lesson in here, and it's a, good for a separate message in itself. But they're drinking of a spiritual rock. Notice the rock is spiritual, and it's supplying, it's supplying drink for them, and that rock was Christ. In Numbers chapter 21 and verse number 17, Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. The princes digged the well, the nobles of the people digged it, by the direction of the lawgiver with their staves, and from the wilderness they went to Matanah. So what, what, what did we read, preacher? We read this, that in the midst of the wilderness, when they needed water, God said, stand still and sing, rise up, O well. Rise up, water, from the ground. What do you mean by that? Christ was following them. Everywhere they went, he was there to rescue them and give them everything that they needed. And all they had to do was out in the wilderness is just stop and start singing. I'd like to be with a bunch like that. Amen. When they get hungry, God sends the manna from heaven. They get thirsty, start singing. Up comes the water from the ground. The Lord took care of every need they had. And when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, the shoes on their feet didn't wear out. Clothes lasted 40. You can't get stuff last six months now. And they wore it for 40 years out there in the wilderness. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 27, Mark 15, 22, and John 19, 17 talk about the, first, the same thing. Matthew 27, verse 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull. And there has to be a rock. And how do you know that, preacher? Because Golgotha means a skull, a place of a skull. Well, you can't form a skull in dirt. The skull was carved in the rock. It was cut in the rock. And you can go to the Holy Land now. I've been there to what's called the Garden Tomb many times. I think six times total. And there, if you look at that Garden Tomb, if you look at that skull, you can see an Arab bus station. It's like I just, I'll tell you what I'm looking at now. I've been there. The Arab bus station's right here. You look right behind it and up, and there is a skull on this hill. And that skull is carved into the hill in stone. On top of that hill, traditionally, is where they say the Lord Jesus was crucified. Right there on top of that hill with a skull right at his feet. Now, that's what they, that's what they say. Who can prove one thing or the other? But I, I have no problem accepting the fact that that skull right there, I'm looking at it, right down to my left is the garden tomb. The garden tomb is a tomb that is a first century Jewish tomb that is cut right into the bank. You can go in that tomb, and you can walk through there, and it's got one side over here and another side over there. And this is where the tradition says the English are the ones who run this site, the British, and they say that this is where Christ was buried. They say, here's how we know. Underneath this garden tomb is a huge cistern, and the cistern is where they gather water, like we talked about earlier in the message tonight. The cistern is there to gather water. Why? It's a garden. They gather the water so that they can, so that they can water, the, water the, the, uh, the flowers and the fruit and whatever else they have in the garden. The cistern is there. So everything is there that goes back to a first century tomb that would be owned by a rich man. Farmer wouldn't own that. A rich man would own that. And Joseph of Arimathea got the body of the Lord Jesus Christ he pleaded for that body, and Joseph of Arimathea, folks, was a rich man. He was a rich man. And he took his body, and he laid it in that tomb. And so he took his body where he had been crucified within a stone's throw, folks. You can throw a rock from the garden tomb to Golgotha. It's that close. It's that close. And took the body from that, from that, from that, uh, from that crucifixion, and they laid it in the tomb. And there he lay for three days and three nights in the garden tomb, Golgotha. As I've told you before, Moriah is a, is a long mountain structure. 
Moriah is where Abraham went 1,900 years before Christ and took Isaac to the top of Moriah. Moriah in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew word. It means where God sees and where God will be seen. And so he took his son Isaac to the top of Moriah. There was the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. That is where they built the temple on the Temple Mount. And all of that's there. You could go, if God makes it possible for you, you ought to go sometime. You'll never forget it. It's quite an experience. But the stones that they built that temple from, they used to build the temple, were taken from the local area. And they went north and queried the stones. And this is what our guide told us. They queried these stones and carried them back, and they were used to build the temple of Solomon. Now, in the process of querying these stones, in other words, cutting them out of the ground, they formed a huge hole in the ground. And that hole that they formed in the ground is where the road runs and where the Damascus Gate is located. And then if you cross that road and go straight north, you come to Golgotha. Golgotha at one time had been part of the Temple Mount of Moriah. It came into being because they took the stones and they used them to build the temple. And when they got to that area, it was so ugly. The stones were so ugly that the builders rejected them. They rejected those stones. And by doing that, they left the face of a skull cut into the wall of the stone. And there, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. The old rabbis, many of them have taught that Adam, Adam, the first man Adam, was created from the dirt at Moriah. That it was there that God reached down and took hold of a hand of dirt at the top of Moriah, he made Adam's body and he breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. We know that in Hebrews chapter number 7, from Hebrews 7 and from Genesis, when Abraham went into that area after, uh, 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 many years after the, uh, obviously, the creation of man, he went into that area and there was a priest there and his name was Melchizedek. He was not a Jewish priest. He was not a priest that had been ordained by anyone on this earth. But he was superior to Abraham. For the Bible said Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Abraham had already been blessed. How can you bless someone who has already been blessed of God? But the Bible says that the less is blessed of the greater. What's that saying about Melchizedek? That's saying Melchizedek is not a human being like you and me. He's different. Who is he? I'm not going to say he's the son of God. Some say he's Shem. There's a lot of controversy about who Melchizedek is. But here's the bottom line. Here is for certain. Melchizedek was connected with Moriah. He was connected with Jerusalem. He was connected with the city when it was a Jebusite city before David ever took it and made the capital of Israel from the top of Mar from, from, from the Jebusites. It belonged, it belonged to the Jebusites, but before the Jebusites, it was the mountain of the Lord. He said, take him to the mountain of the Lord, and that's where Abraham took Isaac. So it tells you that God has a witness and power and authority on this earth before he ever called Aaron apart and gave him the Aaronic priesthood. There at Moriah, God sees, God will be seen. It was at Moriah the Lord Jesus was crucified. I see God. I see God nailed to that tree. I see God nailed on that cross. But God also sees me. Because at that cross, the Lord Jesus Christ looked at them that stood below him and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. To a thief on one side who cursed him, and to a thief on the other side that said to him, Lord... I am here because I deserve to be here. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. When Christ is looking down from the cross, he has a vision that nobody else has. He sees Mary standing next to John. And he says, Mary, behold thy son. He says, John, behold thy mother. And dismiss them at that moment. 
he sees from Calvary. If you ever expect to see God, if you ever expect to know him, you'll know him through Calvary. You'll know him at Golgotha, or you'll never know him at all. There is no way around Moriah, and that's a beautiful place. There's no way around Moriah. David bought the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Remember, the Jebusites were the ones who had control of Moriah. He bought a threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. A threshing floor is a powerful thing because you separate chaff from wheat. Where was that done? At Moriah. And he bought that. David bought that. And when he bought that, it became the plot for the temple of the Lord. David could not build the temple, but who built it? Solomon, his son. Amen. But it was bought and paid for at Moriah. I've been there. It'll take your breath away. It'll take your breath away to walk in that ancient city. Walk behind those, those walls built by Suleiman the Magnificent. Walk in there on that place where you've got the Temple Mount. Walk down beneath it and look at, a, and look at, look at it as it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. I got so far down under the Temple Mount one time. I know we were at least 30 or 40 feet below the surface of the ground. And the guide said, come over here and look. We walked over and we looked down. And a good 30 feet on down below where we stood, we saw these pillars. Stone pillars, deep, deep, deep underneath the ground. Where? Moriah. They haven't even begun to excavate what all is underneath Moriah. One of the reasons they haven't is because there's so much conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis. And the Arabs do not want them to touch it. And so you've got all of this conflict going on. They've done a lot of excavation, but there's a lot that, that needs to be done. I'll say this, and then I'll shut up tonight. To give you an idea of what kind of people you're dealing with, about 20 years ago, these Arabs took bulldozers in an area underneath the Temple Mount was called the stables. They say that these are called the stables because they say the Crusaders used these during the times of the Crusades, starting 1200 A.D. and past that. You know how important archaeology is. Do you know how that when they, they use a brush and they brush the dirt away because they don't want to move anything. They want it to stay exactly, they call it in situ. They want it to be right there. They'll learn. They go in there with bulldozers. And they scoop up all of this ancient history underneath the Temple Mount. Now check me out if you don't believe me. I challenge anybody to check me out. They go in there with bulldozers. They bulldoze this stuff up. Then they carry it outside the walls and the gates of Jerusalem and they take it out and they dump it in a trash dump. They dump precious archaeological uh, artifacts into a dump. The professors from the Hebrew University the Jewish archaeologists had heart attacks. They went out there behind them and they got in this pile of rubbish and they began to sift through there and find every piece that they could possibly find and put together of what came out from underneath the Temple Mount. And rightfully so. That's their heritage and their history. These are professors from Hebrew University, archaeologists. And here they are out there digging in this trash heap that these, that these, that these uh, Palestinians had dug up with bulldozers and, and carried outside the, uh, Jerusalem. And a lot of people, they think that's in, they're, they're incredulous when I say that. They think that couldn't have happened. I mean, how could, how could, a, how could, a, a, how could a, a civilized human being do something like that? Well, you saw what ISIS has done in Palmyra, haven't you? You've seen what they've done in Palmyra. That's been standing there for over 2,000 years, some of that. Now, I know some of that's a bunch of pagan garbage. I understand all that. But so is that stuff in Egypt. That's pagan garbage too, but would you bulldoze that? There's a lot to be learned from stuff like that. You can read some, as I say, when it's engraved in stone, it's there forever. You never know what you're liable to find. But anyway, this, this is what you're dealing with over there. That gives you an idea. Go read it for yourself. No, they don't want it. They don't want it. A tail is a mound that has layers. Yes, it's a man-made mound. Tail Dan up in the north, and I've been to Tail Dan. I didn't mean to say this, but it'd be good to know it. I've learned a lot of stuff over there in that area. 
For years, liberal theology says that David never did exist, that he, Israel never had a real kingdom, that, uh, that, uh, you know, that this is all made up for their own uh, glory. Guess what they found at Tel Dan? They found the name of David inscribed in stone. Yes, sir. At first, they refused to accept it because it was so profound. Because it was the first time anything had ever been found in the Holy Land that had the name of David on it. Outside of the Bible itself. But they had to give up after a while. Because there is no question that it came out of that tell that he's talking about, layer. It came out of there. It was proven to be authentic. And it had the name of Hadavid Hamalek Yisrael. David the king of Israel. Boy. You know what that does? You know what that does? That's true. <laughs> the stones are crying out. <laughs> Who said that, brother? Sure he did. How many of you know that? What he just said. The stones will cry out, and they are. They are. <laughs> David, the king of Israel. Hamalek in Hebrew is king. Yisrael is Israel. Hadavid, David, the king of Israel. Hallelujah to God for his word. I believe the Bible. Father, bless your holy word now, the hearing of the people. And thank you for this little time we've had together tonight. And bless them, Father. Maybe it'll stimulate their mind, Father. Maybe it'll make them curious. Maybe they'll want to dig a little deeper into these things I've talked about. Maybe they want to check me out, Lord. I hope they do. I hope they do. I hope they'll go home and type bulldozer, the temple mount. Just type bulldoze, the temple mount, and see what all they pull up. In thy holy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. All right. Page 109.